We have a huge, huge cast of characters tonight at Tallgrass Tap House here on Points in Manhattan. It is the KSO Show. I'm just going to go around the table and tell you who's all here right now. We'll, we'll trade the mics around. It's going to be a really lot of fun. First, Grant Flanders, producer, no Logan Mance. I didn't say extraordinary. Did you notice that? Like, you yeah. expect that I intentionally didn't. <laughs> um, then Logan Mance not here, unfortunately. Derek Young on a microphone right now. Did we even invite a Logan? Did it? <laughs> I guess uh, he's <laughs> not in town, right? He's in Kansas oh, City. Is he? I had no clue. Well, I just know he couldn't come to the basketball game last night, so I assumed he couldn't. That's probably he true. Told us he is it break to still? Is it? Yeah, it yeah, it's it still is? Break. Okay, then he probably is in KC. Right. Uh, you're out of school. You're graduating. Exactly. So, know. yeah, I, I don't know. We yeah, cracked know. the case. Okay. Right. Uh, DY's here. Yes. You get a lot of water this year, right? That's the thing. Oh, so much water because I had so much something else before the new year. Yeah, you had a rough one. You had a rough one. You heard about it on the last KSO show. Uh, Chris Nelson. I hope is, this is like is riding here. a bike. Yeah, yeah, you sound as good as yeah. you ever have. Good. Now, the rest of these people aren't on mic right now, but they will be perhaps throughout the show. Uh, Mason Voth from K-Man fame with his Dallas Cowboys jacket on. Uh, Natalie Hall, her job here is to is to yell at me every 15 or so minutes and rotate in new people on the microphone, so hopefully she can do that. John Kurtz, way down at the end of the table, also of K-Man fame. Uh, he doesn't have a Cowboys jacket on, but has the nicest jacket. I think of anybody on because Flanders doesn't have his on. Uh, not as nice as Flanders, but not have it on. We have uh, KSU underscore fan on the far, my far left. No Mike, he'll be on later. We also have two, I mean, the sincerely special guests. We have uh, Grant Flanders. I don't, to, I don't want to say the name, you know, just mother, mother and Tammy left. Father in law. <laughs> I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to say the appropriate. Yeah, but they came from Michigan. They left at 5 30 this morning. They're here listening to Grant. And I still, I'll tell you what, Flando, she has been somewhat critical of you. Oh, today. I mean, that's, that's how it's been growing up. Why do you think I'm so good at taking criticism? You are. He is. He is. Um, he is obnoxiously good at taking criticism. The best I've ever heard of taking criticism. So, um, I've got a number of questions from people on the foundation. I want to keep this to about an hour. Uh, so, if we skip your question, please don't take offense to it. I may use it for something else that I'm selfishly going to start next week, podcast wise. Uh, D.Y., this first question I'm going to ask you from D. Fleur. Okay. First first question, actually. Kurtz asked me this in a text like two weeks ago, and I told him I didn't know. Do you know how to pronounce Rubley's last name? Is it Rubley? Is it Rubley? It is Rubley, Kurtz says. So, said it right all along. Curious about the outside impressions after K-State landed Rubley. I guess, what are you hearing? Are there analysts, coaches, et cetera? What kind of, perhaps, you know, buzz did that create? Uh... I actually think it's just momentum that they carry from the commitments that they got before. And I think the, the buzz that's really created has probably been more fan-centric than anything else. I don't think that it's really catapulted or, you know, jump-started anything else that hadn't already been brewing. So probably not getting the, the big buzz or turning into something like maybe fans would want. But it's also common. Uh, I think some of that gets overplayed, and certainly it is in this case. But because they're they're already trending in the right direction for several good players, even without Ruby's commitment. I'm going to throw this one at both Flando and Nelson. The question also from Dave Fleur asks, who will be leaving K-State first, Scotty Hazelton or Bruce Weber? I think it's a good question. You know, Bruce, and, and, this, and Bruce Weber is obviously, you know, in his 60s, he's not going to coach forever. Scotty Hazelton could be... Well, des- well desired. So, if, uh, Nelson, you first. Who's leaving K State first? Bruce Weber or Scotty Hazelton? I think this probably won't be what Flando says, but I'm going to say Bruce Weber. I and not because he's fired or anything. I just think he might retire. And I think yeah. Scotty Hazelton likes likes living here. I think his wife likes it here. It's a great place to raise their family. And so I. I can see if, if we can step up and take care of him financially that, that he could be here a while, hopefully. Very, very well-reasoned answer, the kind we're going to get from Flanders, too. Yeah, I mean, I like that we're different because I'm going to say Scotty Hazelton leaves before Bruce Weber. I think I think Coach Weber loves coaching. I don't see him going anywhere else uh, to coach, so I assume he retires at K-State, and I could see him coaching as long as a lot of these older coaches have gone. I mean, you see Izzo and Chizeski still going at it. I could see uh, Weber. I just would have said Coach K. Coach K. Coach K. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I could see him going as long as those guys. So I would break the tie and say Hazelton. I'm just thinking I'm, – I'm not going to answer one question on this. That's my reason. We have a lot of great people to answer questions, and I can just say I have no opinions on anything. And when you guys are wrong, I'll point back and say, oh, D.Y. said Hazelton, you know, or whatever. So, so yeah, it's easy to be the host. Hazelton. If for, if for Hazelton, I think it would be the NFL, if anything. I'm going to ask D.Y. the next question from Neilio 2. I apologize, as always, to Neilio. Neilio, without the two, was the original one. 
He had some subscription issues that were not his fault. Rivals, the best game they, name they could give him was Neilio 2. He didn't complain. He just dealt with it. Moving on with Neilio 2. He's one two. and two. Yeah, he's number one in our heart. Uh, DY, you've probably heard similar questions to this. Late signing period coming up here relatively soon. Do you think there's a particular position they're looking at more than others or just thoughts on that period coming up? Because there's probably about 60 more questions. Yeah. right? And they're good questions, not criticizing throughout this chat, asking similar things. I think that they're, they're about done just at nearly every position. If they were going to get any additional help, maybe another corner, maybe another offensive tackle. Um, other than that, I think they probably feel fairly comfortable with what they have. I think they're going to explore the transfer market more than anything. I'm going to move on to Flando for the next question from Neilio 2 It's about hoops. He's very curious about Devy and Bradford. He's looking forward to seeing him to come to K-State, but he doesn't know who to compare him to. Flando, of course, you watched a lot of video, talked to some people off the record, on the record about him. You know, does he look like a James Love? The question, you know, is you know, Nigel Shadley by Stockard, somebody different. He actually asked for a Flando breakdown, so I'm glad I asked you. Yeah. Davion and Bradford. Yeah, he's different than all those guys, I think. Uh, he's, he's, quick. he's not the quickest guy in the world, but he's quicker than a James Love. He's not as athletic as a Nigel Shad, but still has a lot of bounce to him. And he's he's just bigger and stronger than Levi Stockard. So he's going to be a true center, and that's what he'll play, seven-footer. And, I mean, I can't think of a straight comparison outside of K-State right now to think of who I'd pick, but he's going to be the guy that they want to be a paint protector down low. I don't think he starts right away. Yeah, He has a chance to, but um, I do think... It's going to take a few years for him to really accumulate or acclimate to the team, and it'll be interesting to see like, because he's not the typical five that Weber likes to have, uh, a guy who can guard out at the perimeter and stuff like that on pick and rolls and stuff, but um, he's a pay protector that I do think K-State has been looking for, someone who can block shots like an Azabuki does for KU. A dream scenario, man, you know, Kevin Samuel from TCU. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not saying he's going to be. He's probably not going to be. That yeah. kid's a really good player. But the you, can't, top, you yeah. can't stop taking bigs because you'll never get something like that if you don't, you and, don't, if you don't try. I don't know if they've gotten a top 150 guy like at his size in a, in a long time. So That's what they it. hoped James Love would have been. Right, yep. right. Nelson, I'm going to throw this last one here at you from Neilio. What are your thoughts on what the South End Zone expansion looks like? Just the pictures, how it looks. Do you think you wanted to see more from this project? Just just, just uh, rant about it for a little bit. No, I, I actually like it. Um, I, I like having the the video boards in the corner to kind of mirror mirror the other side. Yeah. And, you know, I don't think we need a ton of extra seats, so I, I think it probably adds about the right amount of seats or if it adds any. And most of all, um, you know, I've selfishly been saying for years that I wanted them to connect Bramwich to the stadium because I've been in the Legends Zoom like two or three times during a basketball game, and it's just miserable because you're shoulder to shoulder, and there's not even worth going into at halftime because it's so packed. And so they've desperately needed to expand that Congrats space. on being rich. <laughs> I wasn't paying. <laughs> I've been there once, and it was because somebody gave me a NASA ticket to way back in the day. So, yeah, I think it, it serves two pur- purposes with both basketball and football, and, yeah, I, I, I think it'll be a very nice addition. Well, well done. Don't fumble as I got a hoops question. I'm not going to ask them all to Flando. I'm going to ask D.Y. this, you know, just your opinion on this. And it's a good question. Yeah. If one is trying to be positive, what is salvageable from this current K-State basketball season? What positive signs would you be looking for? Or in what players would be looking to see good things from? So positive, D.Y., what's salvageable? What can you hope to have happen this season still in basketball? I think salvageable is that you want to see the, the progression and growth from your young players that you're going to count on a year from now because uh, if you're probably being rational as, as a fan right now, you probably see – the NCAA tournament's probably not going to be within grasp with the way that the season is is transpiring. So you want to see promise for the future seasons and how you're going to make the NCAA tournament, and that's your youth because you're going to you're going to count on Dejuan Gordon. You're going to you're going to you're going to count on Antonio Gordon. You're going to count on these guys for multiple years. So you need to see them make the gradual improvement throughout the year. They need to be a different player at the end of the season than they are now, and especially Dejuan Gordon, I think, because that was supposed to be the highlight player of the class. That's why he's also a diverse, versatile, talented basketball talker, too, yeah. Flando. You did a really good job, I think. You got to lean your in. Take, you got to lean in. I mean, I think you, you hit it on the head. I mean, see the young guys continue to progress. I mean, that's what salvages this season, and I think they've already just playing them a bunch of minutes like they have is going to be huge for the coming years. And then then recruiting in general, you, <laughs> you look at who's coming in, in next class, I think it's better than what 
they had in this past on class. On paper, That's, for sure. Yeah, on paper. And this class has got three guys who are con- contributing right away. So, yeah, I think a lot of sal- salvageable things <laughs> going into the season. Can't talk tonight. Coach S. Jeez. <laughs> Coach K, Coach K is a Coach really S. funny joke. I thought it was funny. Um, I'm going to move on to kind of a lightning round. Scott Wildcat provided a bunch of sincerely really cool questions. Cool. So I'm just going to ask Nelson one, then I'll ask DY one, then I'll ask Flando one. Nats is still on the duty of, of cycling in new talent for me, but she hasn't stopped talking to Kurtz <laughs> like down there the higher time. So uh, it's fair. <laughs> it's fair enough. Four minutes, she says. I was just minutes. having fun with you, Nats. Nats. Don't get offended down there. This whole table. <laughs> holy cow. I can't Ooh. make a joke here. Good, good. They're talking about fantasy football down there. Nats did finish second in our league. Um, I had the best team, though. Like, I, I had the best regular regular season record. Like, I don't care who won the league. I was the best team. Oh, anyway, Scott Wildcat. I won. I don't think you can make a realistic assumption that K-State basketball turns around and makes it the NCAA tournament. I would agree with that. And it's getting harder to make a realistic assumption they can get to the NIT, which I also agree with. Do you agree with my bleak outlook? Or do you think they can realistically hope for an NIT bid? Uh, I'll put Nelson on this, so he's not the bad guy, though. I don't think so. I think the answer is no to this. Not I'll let a Nelson answer it the no. same. So go ahead. No, yeah. no. I agree. So <laughs> yeah. this is for you, then, Flanders. If you don't think the NIT bid is a realistic hope for this season, which all of us you know, who have kind of shared our thoughts said we do not, what would you say is something fans could or should root for and look for? So a different-ish question. Of course, the answer is going to be young players, etc. Well, you have 16 Big 12 games left, and at Alabama, like what kind of results maybe could show you the team's getting better, even if it's not you know specific to players or wins. So what I'm saying is like, do you want to see a little streak against some bad teams in the league? What can happen in this Big 12 season that's possible for K State? Well, how about how about BKU once? <laughs> With I mean, nice, I mean, nice, I mean yeah. uh, stretch. <laughs> a couple years ago, a team that I don't think made the tournament had Marcus Foster on the team. That team was able to. Nigel BKU Johnson once, sure. yeah. yeah, and so who knows? But I don't know. Besides that, yeah, get on a little streak against some some low, su- subpar teams. But you would have liked to see that against Oklahoma and TCU to start the season off. So it's hard to see. But I mean, yeah, it's a bleak season. But yeah, the future is still bright. Do so. some things at home. Yeah, yeah, beat some good teams at home. Maybe you can beat a bad Texas team in Austin. You know, I'll be yeah. the guy who says the last time K-State started going to the Big 12, they won the Big 12 championship. <laughs> so, I mean, they're clearly on a trend to do that. Raise the banner. Exactly. <laughs> Raise that banner again. I might save that for a year. Um, <laughs> DY, I'm putting you on the optimistic train again. If yeah. you're trying to be optimistic when it comes to K-State basketball, what would you tell fans to make them believe the NCAA tournament is a possibility next season? That Dejuan Gordon's going to be, you know, the, the heralded recruit that we thought he'd be uh, a year from now. Um, David Sloan's going to get better on defense. Uh, just you'll have shooting next year with Nigel Pack, uh, another good playmaker in Sultan Miguel. You're bringing in the most talented recruiting class they brought in, and you know how long? It's pro- definitely it's Coach Weber's class. best class. Yeah. So uh, you're bringing in a little bit more shooting than you, than you've had. You still have some defenders, and maybe Dejuan Gordon breaks out. So those are the things to maybe look towards if you're if you're looking to make that tournament. Uh, but it's going to be a very heavy freshman and sophomore laden team. Same question is flipped to you, Nelson. If you were a pessimist, why will they not make the tournament next oh, year? Oh, perfect. I, I was prepared yeah. for that. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, I mean, as bad and as frustrating as Mac has been this year, you could argue we may be even worse at the five spot right. next year. There, I mean, there's well, a chance. Yeah. Um, Sneed, even though he was up and down some in non-con, he's, he's been very most good. of our offense during these two games so far, so we lose him. Um, I'm still very hopeful. I think Gordon and Gordon and Murphy will be great players, but if you look at them compared to Cam, Barry, and Dean as freshmen, they're not as good as those right. freshmen. Again, that doesn't mean they can't make improvements and become what they were as sophomores even better, but, but they're, they're not, not getting there the same yet. roles those guys had too. Yeah. Right, yeah. So they're, Sorry, like yeah. DY said, they're going to be relying on a ton of freshmen and sophomores next year, and that, that's sometimes not a recipe for success. Flando football for you. Uh-oh. In your, quote, far too early 2020 football season, where would you say you're most optimistic looking at the team, most optimistic on the 2020 football team for K-State, and then biggest questions for you? What's Answer this. It's a, it's a line change. Answer this. Oh, I see what's going on. And then I'm going to okay. trade out some better question answers than you. Um, So just like like I pick, pick a position group, anything here? Like what's, Do you want me to read the question again? Yeah, read it again. All right, Flanders. In your far too early 2020 football season, where would you say you're most optimistic when looking at the team? 
and where okay. are your biggest questions? You can answer this how you want to answer. It could be the schedule, it could be a position group, it could be the coaching staff. Where are you optimistic? What are you worried about? I will say I'm, I'm optimistic about the offense getting a lot better. I think you have talent. On the outside, that's going to be older and, and better. And Malik Knowles, Joshua Youngblood with a year under his belt. And then a senior, Skylar Thompson, who you hope can can make things happen. And I'm going to stick with position. Uh, I'm worried about the defensive line. Besides Hubert, that whole defensive line's gone. Yep. And I think Hubert's going to be great. But it'll be interesting to see. Uh, he will be the only guy on that line people will really look close to. And we saw what happened with Reggie Walker the year after uh, Jordan Willis left. Yeah. He dropped off a cliff. I don't expect it to be the same for Hubert, but the rest of that line is going to they're, they're going to have to find some pieces on that defensive line. I'm going to trade you out now. The Before you do, well, I was going to say, was, can you first like show Kurtz like a button not to push to end the podcast <laughs> before you trade this seat off? No. And maybe Don't even anything. Anything. and maybe and maybe yeah, yeah. it's true. And maybe even like tell him like to do uh, do his best. Do your best. Okay. Okay. So we've traded out. We've got uh, KSU underscore fan. We've got John Kurtz and we've got Mason both. Um, addition by subtraction. Would you guys say? Oh yeah, uh, yeah. You all forget about it? Uh, yeah, but the numbers are the same still. Still so four guys so, yeah. just sitting around. Please, four we mics. got. I bet Derek just took up that whole podcast complaining about oh. Ohio State. Oh, oh he oh, talked yeah. about. Yeah, I mean, who should like, overturn the Buckeyes? Everyone against them, you know. Poor, poor Ohio State. You yeah, it's, know? A, it's yes. like Ohio State's never won a national championship on a call. You right. Know? I mean, never. Right. Never got four in the yeah. Fiesta Bowl. I mean, you know. Terrible, yeah. Right. Yeah. A terrible call too. I'm telling you, Chris Gamble wasn't that. I mean, it was brutal. Terrible call. Brutal. A fraud. Before we get into the rest of these questions for Scott Wildcat and going on. Uh, great jacket. Thank you, Cowboys. And, like and Mike McCarthy, I mean, proven winner. A guy's done it all. He's got a ring. Great, He's great got record. He's got a ring. I mean, won it at AT and T Stadium. Right. What more, right? He knows how to win in that building. What more could you want? Oh, Derek's about to start talking about oh, the Packers <laughs> underachieved. <laughs> I mean, uh, I know they couldn't be in the same. I'm, the same you know, group. I'm very open and optimistic about Mike McCarthy. Let him do <laughs> what he can do. You know, <laughs> yeah. he didn't blow me away. Uh, I would have much preferred Lincoln they, Riley they or Matt hired, Rule, but they they, they hired. Uh, they had the diet rights version mm. of Mike McCarthy and so they hired the RC Cola. Is that better you know? though? That's better though, right? It is, it I is, mean, but it's the same damn thing. <laughs> it's like, I mean, what do they say? If you make your weakest link better, you're better or something like that, but I don't, I don't know. Let's talk K-State. They don't care about Mike McCarthy. I could give here. you Mike McCarthy hot takes all day. We are having some food brought to us. Um, so you guys hear that. We are at Tallgrass Tap House. We like to kind of let you guys hear that stuff over the air because then maybe you want to come here. Appreciate their sponsorship. It's you real fun. Tell them, tell them what you're eating. Also, I don't even mention People's State Bank and Legacy Insurance, uh, our two real sponsors. We're at Tallgrass. I mean, so you get you get it in your head. But I have some plans for Legacy, Legacy Insurance, People's State Bank. I'll talk about next week. Question time. Tough question. I'll make all three of you answer this right off the bat, though, because this okay. is a big one. Did someone have a pot pie? Anybody got pot pie? Pie pot pie. Here? Oh, yeah. You're oh yeah. To speak up, interrupt us at all times. So yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Mason, you had to bet your life. What quarterback will take the most snaps for K State in 2021? So the year Skylar Thompson's gone, who takes the most snaps for K State in 2021? Bet your life on it. Go. Oh man, that's. I mean, that's a really interesting question. I guess at this point, I'm probably just going to say Jaron Lewis, just because. I mean, he was, you know, Kleiman's kind of first guy, and I don't. As much as I think, you know, it might they might be better off having Rubley be that guy. I don't think it will be just because he'll be young. So, I think Jaron Lewis is the guy that I would just lean towards. Same question to Kurtz. <clears throat> Most snaps for K State at quarterback in 2021. What if I said Will Howard? You you could say. What it, if I said Will be Howard because. I know they really like Will Howard, and I know that uh, especially the way that Will Howard finished the year, uh, K State was. I remember Hank Jacobs in particular talking about that when he came on um, our radio show, like how they were afraid that the interest would really pick up in him with the way that he finished the year. So I'm going to say I'll split the difference basically there, right? You, you have like, yeah. and this is, I don't mean this to be a slight to Jaron Lewis, but if we're talking about pedigree, like recruiting pedigree, on the scale, you have Jaron Lewis on one end. Then in the middle, you have Will Howard. And then on the other end, you have Jake Rubley. That's well said. So Will Howard is going to be the best mix of a guy that will have experience a year and a half in the system at that point because he's coming in early. And what's that? 
Oh, okay. I thought DUI was oh. correct. I was like, shoot, what did I do? That? <laughs> never mind, never mind. Uh, so I'll take, I'll yeah. take, I'll take the mix of uh, having like a year and a half experience, plus being a, a guy that was pretty talented and fairly sought after in the recruiting process. I mean, Van, you could go Nick Ost here. You could go Jake Rubley here to be different, or you could pick one of the two that they did, which is probably one of the. Or right you could picks. pick uh, Spencer Rattler grad I mean, transfer. I mean, there's all sorts. Of oh, things. yeah, that could happen. You know, Tanner I'm Mordecai. A condition, but if Rubley does come. For a, ex, a, for a the spring, spring semester, ex, yeah, I, I will pick him. It's because I mean he's rated high in rivals, uh, right? Other places, three, yeah. On other places, highest quarterback recruit at K State since since Freeman, and you could argue he's about even with Freeman and may may surpass him. You never know. So a guy that good has a chance to come in and beat whoever's here. I mean, I, I like the other guys. I think they'll. Very yeah. If he's really all he's made up to be, he's got a chance to, to be the guy. So Scott Wildcat follows up with 2022. Same question. I'm going to just put Rubley on you if you think he's the guy in 21 yeah. 2022. So now, Kurt, you're in a tougher spot because you've said, you know, Will Howard's got a one year starting under his belt. Does Jake Rubley then beat him out after Howard started for a year in 2022? Who gets the most taps in 20? And you're going to have a tough one too. Man, you I won't. I won't. <laughs> yeah. So I feel like there? I've. I, come pretty far down this road you know me and will howard we've seen some things we've we've you're on you're, you're committed to him <laughs> yeah, he's like, daniel sams at this point I, yeah you know what i feel like will howard is, is hashtag my guy here so i'm i'm just gonna go will howard all right going will howard uh i mean i would go jake rubley i the reason i said jaron lewis is just because i think he'll be here longer and he'll just kind of be the guy that they feel comfortable bridging the gap with and just kind of let him get over you know get through a season get to rubley but I don't think you want to waste much time with him. If he is here long enough and he, if he is, you know, even slightly as good as Will Howard or Jaron Lewis as a freshman, you get him out there and play him because you want to use all four years of that. And I, and I'll just say at the end of that season, only two of those guys at the most will be here. Correct. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's my thing. If Will Howard is, you know, as good as he finished his season and whatnot, he's not going to want to be a backup because no quarterback – that is, you know has decent enough talent is going to want to be a backup. And before that happens, and fans are 100% right, it does not mean K-State messed up the situation. No. Yeah. Um, no, oh, it, it, it means no, they no, got no, it right. Right. Yes. Exactly. Right. Exactly. It means they yeah. got it right. Yes. Yeah. Um, God, you guys are smart. I'm telling you what. Those guys can't do Way better as shit, too. I was just, huh? just going to yeah. say, like, I didn't want to say it, but it's significantly better. It's a night and day difference. They're not paying attention. Nelson's looking at me, but Nelson was fine. <laughs> He's I mean, so. Right. How about... What's one thing you'd like to see? I'm going to ask this to Kurtz first. Something you'd like to see Climbing do different in year two than year one? A very open-ended question. Mm. I understand you could answer a million mm. different things, but what would you want to see Chris Climbing do different in year two than year one? I would wow. say I would say win more. Yeah, you know, okay. call, the, call the good plays. Call the good plays. Wear the right uniforms. Um, well, Sorry. here's yeah, uh, do differently. I just, I just did that. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. This wasn't Climbing's call. If they could. Uh, do the unveiling of what uniforms they're going to wear when in a different way so as to not deceive the very nice and kind-hearted media uh that would be great but man i don't like some i mean the problem is and this makes me seem like such a homer but like i don't have a great thing off the top of my head maybe um A lot of the, the the problems have been about the offense, right? Like people complain about the inconsistency of the offense. Um, whatever you can do to try and find some more consistency on the offensive side of the ball, but I don't know how much of that's climbing and how much of that's messing him. I'm going to be honest. I'm, I'm kind of stumped here. I do not have a great answer for you. Yeah, I, I got a good answer, too, for this, in my opinion. I just think... Wait, what the hell is this? What, he was begging to come on. Yeah, <laughs> in my opinion, if I, if I had to think back on one thing that they did this year that... That sucked. And maybe turned into you a problem at times was the, some of the rotation. They like to sub mm-hmm. in and out so much. And I thought there was... There wasn't a bunch of times, but I thought there was probably two or three times throughout the year where it's like... Maybe you could have rode someone a little bit longer than you made than they did. To build off like of James that, James Gilbert and the Liberty Bowl. Yeah. Is that, to okay. build off of that, I would just say in general, don't be so married to what you do. Whether that be you know, if you want to run Good the ball more, for everybody, don't yeah. be so married to. Says but the guy who just got engaged. Guy engaged. <laughs> but really, I hope you're listening. But what I'm saying is like you know, the running back rotation was frustrating at times, but yeah. also if we know that you want to run the ball, we get that. But you know. 
throw the ball more if the run game isn't working or don't throw the ball if the passing game's not working. Oh. I just think they need to be less married to something. I thought of something. Okay, bring it. I would say be a little bit more gutsy and less conservative. I was wondering that, if you're going to think about the field goal. That, yeah. yeah, that is something we saw like throughout. I would even say into the game plan for the Liberty Bowl where it was it, they were trying so hard to play like complementary football and not put the defense in tough spots. I think they could have been more risky in trying to throw the ball down the field sooner as we saw on that game tying touchdown drive. So like I think in general that that is a good one. In general, Kleiman perhaps adapting a little bit to being less conservative in the way that he manages a game. I'll put the same one on you, but I'll give you a chance to answer different. Either something you want to see different, like they all did, or is there anything you thought you did see him adjust throughout the year that you thought maybe, hey, let's see more of that and keep working that direction. So either well, either way. To go, to go along with your last point, I've got, a, I mean, I've got kind of an offensive one and defense. Yeah. And, um, offensively, I think you've got to really decide what the identity is going to be. They, they came in and we saw the first few games, there's two back offense and there's a full back and, and running power. And as we got into Big 12 play, that stuff just didn't work. And we still ran it out there once in a while. And I pointed out a couple times in the, in the bowl game where we ran two back power and got nothing. And then it gets you behind the chains. It gets you like third and long. It gets you like second and long. And I think they've got to decide whether or not they want to run two back as much or even if at all. I mean, you can still get a lot of the same stuff with the, with the two tight end stuff and their H back tight end stuff. So that's the one where they did adjust as the season went along. They went from, they went away from two back power for the most part and ran. Tons of different types of options, which most, I mean, I'm not trying to be that guy, but most fans probably don't notice. But we right. didn't block a guy almost every play when we ran the ball with one back. Because there was an option read, even though it's, it was often a cold give. And defensively, they've got to figure out how to not give up big plays. I mean, I've, I've got my 30 year chart of yards per play given up by the defense, and this defense was, I think, 29 or 28 in the 30 years of case State football. Now, the scoring part was up in the middle, so that was a good thing. But if the good things this defense did to stop people from scoring can take away those big plays, even a half a dozen of them, then you're talking about a team that may have won nine or ten games this year. So, it's those, those are my things. How many games next year do we think uh, the opposing team tries busting out a trick play? Because, oh, you got one or two of them. If, you know, it's not a weird pass, they get two to work. Navy got two to work. Every uh, The fake punt at Tech, Texas all Tech, of these. And K-State punch, show yeah. that they just don't have the ability to stop I, it right now. I wouldn't say Oklahoma got two to work because the one that they got to pick on, they took away the first read, which, yeah. I mean, like on a trick play, that's that's all you can really ask for. And that would – this kind of brings up a point where figuring out maybe this would be a little more disciplined because we saw penalties happen at times that kind of kept drives going on, on, on the defensive side of the ball. And, and like you said, you, getting beat on a um, trick play for the most part is a lack of discipline by defenders, getting their eyes in the wrong spot. They did a lot of good things, but a little more discipline is, is probably something that they've got to figure out a way to, to, to And handle. the Liberty Bowl is probably the most frustrating showing of that because, I mean, the last game you saw, nobody else was playing football, and Navy was able to get their only pass completed on a trick play. Like, you had to know it's going to happen. They get one, and then they get the one to win the game. I had hiccup, so sorry about that. Oh, Come trick, back to you, fam. Trick plays are for losers. Yeah, be a man. You know, run a yeah. run a Navy run one. A gap power dive every time. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's what we should. You should you should know what the play is before the snap. In my yeah, opinion, yeah, exactly. You know, like every team should know what it is. You know, I saw Pete Bell once. Have you seen the movie um, Blue Chips? Are you it's been a long time. It's been a long time. Well, Pete Bell said that movie said, "I'll tell Bobby Knight our plays are because it doesn't matter what our plays are. It's how you do it." You know, what I mean, so I believe in what Pete Bell said. Um, <laughs> this is also. Oh, I'm gonna go back up. Kansas walk at 11 had one. I wanted, He talked about football recruiting at DUI. Kind of talked about what's going on in February. He also asked how long Antonio Gordon is out. I don't know for sure. I know they had a reasonable belief he could play this Saturday at Texas. Um, so I don't think it's long term, but we'll see if it's back back there. I'm coming back to you, fan. I know I asked you the last question too, but this feel like it's written for you from StatCat. <laughs> Now they're about halfway through their freshman years. How would you say De Dejuan Gordon, Antonio Gordon, and Montavious Murphy have done compared to what you maybe you thought? Not even statistically, just what you thought. And then also, what do you think their ceilings are down the line for each of those guys? So how have they been so far, and then what could they be big picture? I would say 
Murphy has probably been about what I thought he would be. Antonio has exceeded expectations because yeah. I think many thought he would be I, yeah. a role player at best. You know, maybe four or five minutes a game. And then Dijon, I don't want to be critical, but I think he's probably a little less. I agree. I, mean, I think we thought he may be more of a scorer. Um, and, and, you know, there were rumors of whether or not he could be a guard or a combo. Yeah. I don't think that's what he's going to be. And I think the, the bad thing is that's what this team really needs right now. If you lose Williams, you really don't have a lot of options in the guard spot. Yeah. Yeah. Without that, you're putting so much more pressure on three guys to have to pass. And I think they've handled it really well. I mean, honestly, you can look back at the season and say injuries to freshmen have maybe cost us two or three games. Yeah. Because I sincerely believe if we have Antonio Gordon against TCU, the, the rebounding he brings, we may win that game. And then TCU what, the pit, the pit game the without Murphy? Pit game, yeah. yeah. And, then, and then you probably don't lose the second one if you beat Pitt. Because I just think after you lose the pit like that, you yeah. kind of just... No, you're right. I mean, that, I think those guys have been really good. I mean, the, the funny thing about Gordon is he has a half once in a while where you know, he'll score 12, 15 points yeah. and a half. And it's, it makes, him, makes threes. And you see glimpses of what he can be, and I think he's going to be the best of the bunch. I think he's definitely got potential to be an all-Big 12 type player. Uh, the other two may be on the one or the other. Yeah. I don't think both are going to be there. And, and Dejuan, like he just still looks young. Yes. And I said it earlier this week on our show where – He's in the position, like, we talked about Josh Youngblood in football, thinking he would contribute, but he's just a young wide receiver. It's easier for a big man, I think, to come to college and contribute immediately because you already have the size and everything. Dejuan, it's going to take time adjusting to the Big 12 style of play and then stuff in the offseason and getting bigger and not being so young. Another thing I would add here with Dejuan, and I love the kid. I would agree with everything that's been said probably got a little bit too much hype you can blame honestly yeah. like rivals yep. uh, for getting everybody a little bit too excited about what his instant impact would be you still think he's going to be a phenomenal player and he shows flashes of it but the other thing is <laughs> talking to him this is not like a slight to him but he's he's a young kid like you can he he seems like a kid when you talk to him as yeah. opposed to like a mature you know there's a big difference and you can see you know, i've seen so many guys in their careers at k-state go through it but right now he's definitely fairly wide-eyed as a as a kid there and that's not meant to be a slight to him at all but I did a one-on-one -on -one interview with him for uh, Powercat game day earlier this week and it was kind of you can just tell like talking to him like he's still trying to figure out a lot of things in life which is a part of what we forget about in college athletics sometimes so that's a part of where I say like yeah let's temper the expectations right. with him because Dejuan this is a culture shock for him a culture adjustment for him coming from Chicago and he's still like an 18-year-old kid that's very much a kid. I think he desperately wants to do well to the point that it hurts him sometimes. So nothing about that worries me about his future, but he's just someone that's going to take some maturing yep. uh, physically and mentally. This is from E. Ham, and I think I'm going to ask it to each of you, too. Let me give you the scenario. Out of the blue, you get a call from mis of a mystery donor willing to donate $100 million to Case Athletics, and for some reason, he wants you to choose the project to donate to. The catch is, it cannot be simply donating to an already announced project. It has to be a new building, renovation, program, etc. What do you choose? For reference, the West Stadium project costs around $81 million. So, in theory, this person's telling you get enough money to do a project similar or bigger in scope at the West Stadium Center, but you can't do what they're already doing. You can't just say, oh, south end zone, you know? So, but if you want to do something wild, $100 million. Mason, what do you got? Well, first off, Eric Kennard, welcome to K-State Online. <laughs> uh, oh, turn it off. Turn off the show. We can't do better than that. We can't do better than that. But I, I would say, you know, find some way. You know, obviously they're trying to do things with Bramlage, but trying to make where basketball is played a little bit more exciting, a little bit more inspiring. It doesn't even have to be, you know, some elaborate type place. Just unique looking. Right now, Bramlage is lucky that it's even an octagon to make it that much more exciting. But the Lloyd Noble Center is boring, but it's kind of unique and strange. So just something that kind of leaves a memory in people's heads. That's what I would like to see, something basketball-related. Yeah, I would, I would go basketball-related. It's kind of... We, it's in the plan, so it doesn't really get. I can't think of anything new that would be. No, I got that. Because I would spend it on football or basketball. I'm going to be honest. Sorry, Eric. Um, but I would, I would put the money in Bramlage. 
Uh, I would limestone the whole outside, first of all. I mean, I think it should be matching the stadium mm -hmm. and the campus. But I, I, I like the idea of having a concourse in there, um, a little more room, and, and a big concourse on the, on the top. It's two levels somehow. I mean, it's hard because it's a big concrete pit. No, I know there's people who yeah. want to do that, yeah. But those are the things I'd like to see. I agree with you. And a new court design, maybe. Even lowering the court down a little bit and making the, the crowd closer. Any of those things. Kurtz, I thought you and me were both mid-food. So I went out of order there. Yeah, no, that's totally cool. But and yeah. I, I mean, they took, uh, like, the two things that I think are desperately needed are, like, for the God's sake, can we get a basketball arena with more than one or, or two, like, bathrooms for everybody that's on, like, the lower level? <laughs> that is true. I, don't right? I mean, it that, is yeah. incredible. Uh, anyway, but, yeah, Bramlage desperately, I mean. Garage doors shaking during press conferences. Yeah, like, we're in a, yeah, we're in a closet for press conferences. <laughs> I mean, I do love Bramlage in a way, but yeah, it's not a it's not a great venue for being honest. So yeah, whatever you can do to improve that, and I'm not even like this is not really my forte, like being facilities not guy. Either. It's not really my thing. Um, but the only other thing I would say is the the thing that's desperately needed that you can tell is indoor football practice facility, which is on the way anyway. And so I guess I can't do that. But if I if I could, if I may, to piss everybody off here. <laughs> What I would do is I would personally take my $100 million check to Gene Taylor's office, which I've been in. Great office. Overlooks the stadium. It's perfect. Shake his hand. Say hello, Gene. I, say, oh, hi, hi, John. I am giving you Gene. I'll play Gene in this. Yeah, this yeah. is great. Hey, Gene, how's it going? Oh, pretty good, John. Always nice to have you here. Gene, you got a great handshake. Have I ever told you that? Uh, you have, and every time you do, I kind of wonder why you tell me every time. Oh, but okay. Anyway, well, yeah. you know, I just, you know, we're a couple buddies. A couple well, buddies. We're friends. We're friends, yeah. yes. All right, so in my hand here, I have this $100 million check. Well, okay? we're better friends than I thought even, yeah, John. Yeah, exactly. How about that handshake now, buddy? Yeah. Um, what I want you to do, I am only giving you this check. Okay. Only if you personally are the one to break ground, or, or you personally allow me to be the one to break ground on the new indoor football practice facility that will encompass the entire east side parking lot. You're losing all of your parking spots uh, on the John. east side for the most state-of-the-art indoor practice facility this world has ever seen, and that is how I'm giving John, you my $100 I, I million. You, I mean... I you you usually pretty in, in, in like up in the know of what fans are. You usually tell me what the fans are saying. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if you noticed, but the, our current plans call for a, a, a much smaller reduction in parking on the east side, and it is it has raised a stink. So I appreciate your offer. Well, here's the thing, Gene. But I, I thought you I'm were about to lay a, to, take, to change the logo, and I was going to say oh. okay. I mean, I was going to say sure. I'm about to lay a stink bomb, Gene. That's what I'm doing here. <laughs> Well, John, I appreciate the money, and, um, you know, we'll get those lots across the street. We'll get the grass sometimes when it rains. They can't open them. We'll open them up. It'll be safe. It'll be fine. I appreciate the money. Thank you very much. Hey, hey, Nats, are we looking at a, re at a refresh? Or? If they don't want to move, I'll just keep talking to the, the A team. Give me a give me a mix. <laughs> give me give me just Yeah, you just offended Flando's mom. Yeah. <laughs> give me Wow. Yeah, mix it up. Give me give me Nelson pull Here, somebody off. I, I gotta off? I gotta go to the restroom anyway, okay, so someone oh, can wow. take my spot. DY go. for Kurtz. DY for Kurtz. And then we'll bring Nelson or we'll bring Nelson in or Flando for somebody. It's gonna be a really good time. Okay. Um Boy, I, I, brought, I brought D.Y. in for this one. This is from Guns N' Roses 1. Oh, whoa. We love Guns N' Roses. Blaze is firing. Um, Guns N' Roses. Better Guns N' Roses album. Use Your Illusion 1 or Use Your Illusion 2? I don't know. That, was, that wasn't the question either. <laughs> um, but uh, that's not the question. He asked, what do you make of the drones flying in grid patterns in Colorado and western Nebraska? Are they flying in northwestern Kansas? I didn't know that they were. That was his question. Yeah, I, I don't know that either. I asked you on purpose because I knew you wouldn't Do you know. know anything? You would know about this fan? I've heard of it vaguely, but I don't know what's going on. Mason? Of what? Is it, what about these drones flying in grid patterns in Colorado and western Nebraska? Are they flying in west, northwestern Kansas? Huh, interesting. No one knows. Okay, no we're talking about that. A uh, little blue stem asks, <laughs> which team wins more games in their respective season? This year's men's basketball team that's already won seven. Or next year's football team, uh, Mason. 
I mean, I mean, the football team at most can win, you know, what, 15? 15. The men's basketball team already has seven. Yeah. So I don't know, man. This seems kind of easy to me. Yeah, it's going to be basketball because I, I think that based off of what's left for basketball this year, they get at least five more wins and maybe even six or seven because the top four Big 12 teams, I think, are better than what the bottom six is. But that bottom six is all pretty darn close. And I had high hopes for Oklahoma State this year to separate themselves. Well, there's time. Long, they really let me Bruce down. But, again, you, I think there's time. It's a long-ass season. I mean, and, so, Well, yeah. I do think there is time. I said the other day that sometime, sometimes in basketball the balls don't bounce your way. Eventually they're going to start bouncing O-State's way. So, yeah, but I think most of the six teams at the bottom are kind of similar. So the correct answer is basketball. Yeah, basketball. Unless they don't win again. <laughs> <laughs> you know well, I mean? Dy thinks football's only winning six next yeah. year. Is what he told I didn't me. Say that. There's a segment of people out there, and hey, people are entitled to their own opinions. I'm not criticizing. Think what you want to think about people. There's a segment of people that thinks Dy is not a real big fan of Bill Snyder, which isn't really true. Whoa. I mean, I, 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 mean uh, I can tell you for a fact he's no more against Bill Snyder than he is against any college football coach. I mean. But I bring that up because this question is perfect for you because it's begging you to complain about the previous <laughs> staff. So I'm going to put you in a spot set up for failure, absolutely. So from Powercat Eye Doctor, after a full season covering this football staff, DY, what three things do you like the most compared to the previous staff? He gave, I'll give you his answers. Greater access to assistant coaches, willingness of the staff to play a freshman and use the four-game rule to prevent red shirts, and three, a greater emphasis, excitement on recruiting in season. So those are the three things they like better. What are the three things you like better at this staff than Bill Snyder's staff? One would be the full calendar year recruiting. I think that's it's an easy one. Um, number two would probably be the way that they practice. Because uh, I know there's been changes in the way they play during the games, but I think the way that they practice is what's the most different about them. They, the, the young players will play in practice. I think in the past they were on scout team and they never got to install anything, and, and they basically didn't get to learn the offense at Kansas State until they were going to play. Oh, so, Nelson's back in? Yeah, I guess. Mm-hmm. So those are two. The way they practice, full county year recruiting, and I guess access to assistant coaches, although it was probably a little extensive, but I'm not going to complain about it. But that was probably refreshing, and I think fans appreciated it. Nelson and Kurtz are talking about Nelson's Chief shirt, which is an SI shirt. And I tell you, my team's like never win championships. But I remember being a kid, like seeing those commercials when you stay home, when you stay home sick. Booklet. Right, you, yes. you stay home sick from school and you watch Sports Center 90 times and they advertise some team's you know SI thing. And I'm telling you, if my team ever wins one, like I, and SI's dead, I'm gonna make a commemorative booklet or something like that. Because like, that's, that's I have a couple of man. Sports Illustrated and win the Royals one. It's, well, gonna yeah. be, it's gonna be marketed on the front of it. Just uh, Oh, well, Laurie marketed. The Bulls, ever since I got really excited about being a game and a half out of eighth, which not many people say that. Um, no, no, no. I was there a couple collab- years with the maps. beyond that. So now, oh, whatever. Nelson, let me ask you a question here, man. Uh, ask him the last one. I'd like to hear what he said, too. All right, Nelson. I, uh, the question was, what are the three things you like about this staff, Chris Kleiman's staff, more than the previous one, which was spearheaded by Bill Snyder? <laughs> Uh, first, I think that the use of the red shirt rule. I'm getting young guys experience and building depth. Um, and I think more in, in addition to building depth, it just keeps those young kids interested. I think, you know, if they go to practice and know if they have a good week of practice, they have a chance to play in that week. I think it keeps them more invested. Um, the uniforms. I'll, yep. I'll go uniforms. No, and answer. I know we didn't win a game in the uniform, so that may sound like a dumb answer. Yeah, do you not know they're winless in those things? Man. Football and basketball. Football basketball. <laughs> but it's not a coincidence that all of our recruits are where visit pictures or wearing those uniforms. Then I'm not saying we win them. It's by choice. Yeah. We've checked. Yeah, they pick, yeah. yeah I'm, and I'm going to say T. Denton wouldn't have committed if we didn't have all white uniforms in to wear, but it it doesn't hurt. I was going to say, you'd rather have more factors working in your favor than not. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and he had sweet pictures with the purple Jeep, Taylor Bratt's purple Jeep in the barber shop. I will say, if you're going to be a fan who blames losses on uniforms, then be the. And I hope you're the same fan who credits getting Jake Rubley with uniforms because they're both as ridiculous as the other. Jake they, Rubley didn't wear the all whites, right? Though. Check that. Yeah, oh. I mean, yeah. So I'm just saying, like, if you if you want to believe that one leads to the other, give credit to the other side because neither's right. But don't just pick one side and rail on it. 
And, and then the third, maybe getting a little bit specific, and there's a lot of other things I like. And I, I do think Blake Seller did a good job in the previous year, but I love how Scotty Hazleton coaches defense. And I told someone I think he coaches defense almost like coaching offense. But what I mean like that, he, you know, we came with a different game plan he about tries to every set week. Up. Right, yeah, he yeah. set things up. We ran, you know, against KU, we ran a coverage we ran all year. And I think we did that multiple times during the year where we're running plays and things like that on the defense that we hadn't ran all year versus the same old look. We didn't know what to expect. The one thing that I would add to what add they said, because I, I like a lot of Mike that. Mike McCarthy, would you add that? It's a great question. I uh, would not add Mike McCarthy to K-State. I'm, for, I'm but, for Mike McCarthy with you. But I, I think, to me, what I, I like most D-Y about the, the switch from last staff to this staff is the fact that there's better relatability to the people that you're bringing in to actually play for you. Because if someone that's you know 21 years old that isn't inside of veneer every single day can tell that there's better relatability with your coaches, then I can guarantee you that the players understand that there's better relatability. Because I have nothing in common with some of the previous staff coaches. But I guarantee you the staff now, a lot of them have the same interests, some of the same experiences as the players that are playing right now. We got a fun a fun a fun username here, Top Ramen. I'm just trying to look at his, his history to see if it's always been his name, because I just really like the name, or if it's changed. Anyway, I'm going to rotate around. I think this first one's good for Nelson, and you might need some time to talk this out with me, because I couldn't answer this off the top of my head. So you're Bruce Weber, and you get a mulligan on any one recruiting class since your arrival at K-State. So I know this creates some thinking. Which one do you choose? So I guess mulligan just means you get to go back in time and redo that class you know, I guess there's no guarantee it's better, but you get to know what you know now and do it again. So which one are you going who back all and redoing? Was in the class with Love and Nigel Shad. Let's think about. It. I mean, let me just pull it up. Call, you guys would Cardi have been there? Time, and I'm going to pull up. I'm going to pull up the classes. So, yeah. so that class so. with the bigs is kind of biting them a little and bit. Was, was Stockard in that class? No, he was. You got. You guys. Sure, all three were together. Well, let's say what it, let's, it's. Let's say what it's not going to be. It's not going to be the Dean C- Wade C- class. Cardi you know? X. And then I think Stockard and Love were a part of that because I think they've both redshirted at a point, haven't they? The class was Matt. I'm, I'm getting really close to getting this information. So the first class we would have counted for, for Bruce Weber, let me see here, would have been what? So, sorry, I know that the silence isn't good. So this class, okay. that, that's definitely, yeah. 15 so, is definitely his with Barry yeah, Brown. Yeah, 16 is Brian Patrick, Cartier Jada, James Love, Xavier Sneed. Okay, 14. That was his, too. 13 would have had to have been his. Was 13 his first real class as I mumble through this? Class of 12, Daryl Johnson. Michael Orris, he signed Michael Orris, right? So that was him. So here, I'll just walk you through them. 2012 would have been his first class. Daryl Johnson, don't remember him at all. Michael Orris. So that's two guys who did not. Or 13 would have been his first class. But didn't he sign Michael Orris? Yeah. 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 Well, maybe he did. Oh, because he would have been hired. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That may have been like a split class, whatever. So let's forget that. Yeah, I give him a pass for that. So 13. Uh, Marcus Foster, Wesley Wondu, Javon Thomas, Neville Fincher, Nigel Johnson, Jack. I forgot to say his name already. Jack Carapetian. Yeah, there we go. Wow. That's so that's impressive. the 13th. That's the 13th class. It's a good one. Uh, yeah, 14th class. Malik Harris, Trey Harris, Stephen Hurt. Not great. You know, also at a time when the program was struggling a little bit. So, but first, in all honesty, it may have taken having both of the Harrises there to take the complete blow up <laughs> that built K State into what they 20, were last year. 2015 is not going. I'm sure it's not going to be your answer. It included Corby Irvin among others, oh, get um, as well as Cam Miles, Stokes, yeah. Dean Wade. Barry get them out. Don't so, need them. 2016. Brian Patrick, Cartier Jada, James Love. Uh, Xavier Sneed probably not. If that, that, if that didn't have Xavier X. Sneed, yeah. it, then I would say maybe that class. Last 2017, Levi Stalker, Nigel Shad, Mike McGurl. That may be your That's answer. That's a winner. Um, 2018, uh, Gunus Capagel, Austin Tri, Sean Williams. I mean, there's another cool. good, uh, another. 17 good and 18. That's it. Look, there's been some. Yeah, I'm, I'm the biggest Bruce Weber defender in the world, and I think he's a, a very good basketball coach. Right. And I would praise him forever. But he has not had good recruiting classes while he's building good, te- while he's coaching good teams. He hasn't had good. Recruiting and classes and at the Snyder same time. 2.0 it was the same thing because think 2012 really good, and then three years later when that recruiting class would have been contributing. They go oh, six and seven. Uh, so I do that agree all, that. Nelson, what do you got? I mean, well, there's a lot I, of I would go with yeah. either seventeen or eighteen because yeah. that's that's the reason where we're at today. Right. But you certainly could make a case for the fourteen class. 
you know, if that's a good, strong class, I'm not going to sit here and blame Malik Harris for Marcus Foster's issues. Correct. Right. But I think he contributed to some of those issues. And if that is a better class, maybe one, you don't have to blow up that team. And two, if you do, you have a better class behind it to help pick up the pieces. Yeah. I, I think it's the right answer. I would say, if it's for me, I'm picking one of these last two just because – Hindsight lets us know that they still recovered from that. Yes, they had some terrible seasons, yeah, right. but they recovered to go to Elite Eight, win the Big 12 Championship. We know that didn't create the program. So, I'll, and I think they're not going to be created now because of the young guys they have, the young guys next year. But I would take either. I'd probably take the class. I'd probably take the last one. Sean, I, I, I'm probably not to going to take table. 17 because 17 has a contributor right now, Mike McGurl and, and, and Levi Stalker too, right? So that, that at least has people that are here and contributing. All three signings in 2018 all left. Gone. They're gone. Every and single the one. Only one of the three who ever really contributed at all was Austin Trice, and that was an incredibly brief snip. <laughs> I mean, so, so yeah. 2018 is the worst. Made all those free throws. He, he did. He did. Hit, yeah. yeah, 18's right. So, top ramen. Next question. This would be for Flando, but he's down there, and his parents are. I'm not bringing him back. <laughs> Assuming the UTEP transfer signs, he probably will. How many more players do you expect to be in this class? I think they might end up going three, counting him. You know, if you count uh, KC as Agu, I'm not sure how to say his last name. I think they could still take two more. It's going to take more departures, but the chatter we hear, I think they could take three more. I think you know that better than us. So. And I think Flanders <laughs> has even heard. I'll leave that to more premium stuff. I think they, they have a better chance of some better players than I even knew. Uh, how about how about Mace Dog? Who gets more snaps next year? Jack Stanine, who got a lot of snaps yeah. this year, or Christian Moore? True freshman who registered this year at H-back will be a registered freshman this year. I'm sure he's going to play, but Jax might be a starter. Uh, I think it will it might just be Jackson Ean due to the fact that, you know, he already used his red shirt. They can red shirt more and still get him his playing time. And maybe there's not as much of a need to play him as quickly unless he's, you know, head and shoulders above everybody. So I, I would just say Jackson Ean for now. Let's move it on here a little bit. I think that covers all our questions. For, no, no, it doesn't. I will ask one more for Top Ramen. I'm asking to Derek Young. I'm going to let you pick two names, starting two wide receivers next year. Malik Knowles. Uh-huh. Wyking Gill. Okay. I don't have a big problem with it. People are going to want to hear Anybody Young else? that kind of yeah. stuff. That's possible, but, yeah, I bet that's the starting two receivers. Who would you take? In one. I would have been tempted to go to Young Blood, but, I, yeah, I don't yeah. have a argument against. I feel pretty confident it'll be Gil. This is just a statement from Rudy and R, who's come to a number of these shows, so I want to read it. Rudy says, you might remind everyone that this time last year we were not very good either. We lost the first two Big 12 games. We're behind West Virginia by 20 before they barely won. Uh, everyone is wanting to fire Bruce and somehow turn things around. Maybe there, maybe there is hope. I'll say you're right. There absolutely is. If I'm being real and honest, I don't think this team's going to bounce back and have a year or anything like that. But I did not think when they were down 20 to West Virginia in game three of the Big 12, they are going to the Big 12. So my pessimism, I'll be honest, is real for it, but I would have been wrong last year too. And, yeah, if they beat Texas on Saturday, then they get a home game going against West Virginia, Texas Tech. Maybe you win one or two of those. You're two and three. It would feel very different very fast. Yeah. One, Bruce shouldn't be fired no matter what happens. No. But two, this team doesn't have very end. Correct. It, it doesn't. Correct. And, and I would say this. as They're not going to win as many as everyone thought they were going into the season. But it's also they're probably not going to lose as much as everyone thinks they're going to now because they always say you're never as good as you think you are and then you're never as bad as you think you are. Right. We don't Unless you're off. KU in football. <laughs> oh, exactly. We'll just move on because I like that answer. Z Money KSU says, how hard is it to get a word trademarked? For example, the word shoody. Uh, he, he commented on Twitter today about a, a shirt hoodie I was wearing. He called it a shoody. I said, I mean, it's probably your word now. Just take it. But this is for DY. Prediction time. How many four-star recruits does next year's football class have in it? They've got one committed right now, Jake Rubley. Another one could bump up. Another commitments. How many, D.Y.? I would just put the – I'll put it this way because that's – there's targets I don't even know who they're going to be. I'll, I'll put the over-under on three. Nice. That's a great number, I think. Nelson, I want to ask you this. A lot of hoops talk at this pod, but narrow it down. you got to give me one thing. Single biggest issue for the basketball team right now. If you could, see, if you could fix one thing for them other than adding Barry Brown on the team or whatever, <laughs> like what needs fixed more than anything else for them right now? 
this, this may not count as a single issue, but to me the biggest issue is a third of your scholarships are being taken up by Love, Shad, Stalker, and Mac. Yeah. So a third of your scholarships, the one position, two guys aren't playing at all. You're getting underwhelming performance from the other two. You know, if you have two of those scholarships are filled with serviceable big men, the other two are with wings who would be juniors now, then you... Even like a David Sloan quality junior college right. wing. Right. Instead, yeah, just guys who are playing eight or nine minutes contributing a little bit that's yeah. a great point yeah i would say to that the biggest issue to me is your leaders aren't leaders i mean xavier sneed is playing the best that we've seen him play at k-state i think right now but he can only go so so far by leading by example because he may try to be the vocal leader and get everybody in shape but that's just not the kind of personality that xavier sneed is and what cartier jada and McCall May Ween have done this year have been has been incredibly disappointing. So on both, you know, on the court and who knows what's going on off the court with them. My answer would be kind of lame. Uh, it would be confidence, really. And I know that sounds weird, but when just anything goes wrong, bad thoughts creep in their head and they're like, here we go again. Yeah. And they can't get out of a rut because of that. If they just had a little bit of confidence that things were going to come through, I think that would be the difference and some of these one or two point games. Yeah, that's the crazy thing, and I don't want to come off. I, I think they're a bad basketball team right now. I'm not trying to paint it differently, but that is the thing that you do forget. If they don't give up a 12 0 run to close the game at Oklahoma when you're up 7 or 340 left, and if you win that game in overtime against TCU, you don't give up a tip in, what's your record now? 9 and 9 and 5, 2 and 0 in the Big 12. We're all sitting here talking about where they're going to be seated in the turn. And we know, and again, it's like it's like Macy said, you're not as good as you think you're not as bad. They're the same team that could be 9 and 5 and 2 and 0 in the league and we're talking about that kind of stuff. So my point is what D.Y. says, they may not lose as much as we think, although I do think they're going to lose quite a bit. Things really snowball on them. Yeah. And I posted this on the board a while back. What makes it difficult is this team has a lot of complementary pieces, and what makes it even harder is those pieces don't complement each other. I mean, if they had a couple of guys that were really good getting to the basket but couldn't shoot, and a couple more guys who can't sh- or who not good putting on the floor but are really good shooters, those guys can work together. They're a bad offense. team. So, so you're saying it's those guys that graduated last year. <laughs> they're a bad team, but they're not all bad players is yeah. what's yeah. like the most the, frustrating the, the part about bad. this team. Yeah, the black and white results have been bad. Yeah, but I don't think they're a bad team. Yeah. No, right. yeah. Um, they're in every year. Fab 5-4. Out of all the new basketballs coming in, basketball recruits coming in next year, can you see them stepping into starting roles immediately for the team? Let me ask this a different way. I'm just going to – I'll just do this with Nelson, and then we'll skip the next question to D.Y. And, and I'm just going to say each one's name of the commitments and give me a percent chance that they are a, a starter on the team by the end of the year. So, if I, so for example, if I say Nigel Pack, I want you to say the percent chance that by the end of the season he is a starter on the team. So, Nigel Pack. By the end of the season, man, I I hope, and this might be wishful playing, but I'll go 90%. <laughs> I think pretty high, too. Yeah, Let's nope. go to Selton Miguel. 50 Luke Kasubke. 30. Davion Bradford. Oh, man, we're going to be bad at the five, but I'll, <laughs> I'll still go 15. So I'll just ask D. Wine Mason to give me one you disagree on. Not to pick on Nelson too much, but one you're like, boy, that's too low, that was too high. So what's one you heard from Nelson? You're like, ah, I'd, I'd say this. Uh, I'm going to cheat. It's probably two. You get one. You get yeah. one. Yeah. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah, and I'll, I'll take whatever one you I'll, I'll let him have the yeah. Bradford one. I'll say I, th- I feel like Miguel was too high because I think it's Dejuan yeah. Gordon, yeah. you know, those same positions. Yeah, could be. Yeah, I think, it, I think it'll be Bradford just because they will be so bad there. You think he'll start at the five, is that you were saying? I do. Yeah, yeah I, I, and I think maybe because they don't have a choice and they think, well, if, even if he's not ready, it's better to play the freshman that's not ready than – you know, James Love or Nigel Shad, who's the whatever they are that isn't ready. Yeah, well, Levi will have, have to probably play the four next year. So I could see, yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, and, that, and that's why I put Miguel higher than that yeah. in case they do go see, small. I, yeah. and the funny thing, Gordon, Miguel, and which Park. next year they may because the reason right now it seems like they're not doing it is because Xavier Sneed's that's still what, here. That's why I said the funny thing to me is I would almost just take Derek's answer and reverse it. I would have had Miguel's higher because I think he will start, yeah, even though higher. I think Dejuan Gordon will too. I think yeah. I think it could be a situation where the starting lineup at some point we don't know what it's going to be, yeah. guys, but it could be uh, Nigel Pack, Mike McGurl. Dejuan Gordon, uh, Selton Miguel, Montavious Murphy. Uh, I could, be the, I mean, how, it could be the starting five. I'm not saying it will be, but yeah. Yes, how they can have two of those bigs on the floor next year at the same time. 
Next question from Cat Scratch 2. I'm going to just kind of address it and then skip it. He says, we all know Bruce can coach and win with quality players, but is it time for him to reload his staff with coaches who help can recruit quality players? I mean, I would say I think they are doing that. You have, we, we went through a recruiting class and admitted and told you there's some really bad classes you should question. The, the results right now, though, the guys playing right now were his best class here. The class coming next year is the best class here. I do think he has a staff that can recruit quality players. Corn's responsible for Dejuan Gordon. Coach Lowry's been responsible for plenty of good recruits. And Jermaine Henderson has done well yeah. since you could you could make a very good argument yeah. that the coaching staff move in the offseason is actually – was curtailed towards recruiting i mean the results have been uh, we we all you know we're not trying, trying to be what sort of looking for here we're not we're trying not uh do what oh kurtz was asking me a question he needed fries so uh we <laughs> got him down there fries, yeah. i'm not trying to throw shade we all chester frazier's a good coach k-state likes chester frazier there's he wasn't run out they wanted to keep him he's that way virginia tech but the proof of the pudding so far is K-State's been a re- better recruiting staff with Jermaine Henderson on staff so far. We'll see what happens after three or four years of it, but he's done a nice job, I think. Speaking of Jermaine, the Jackson Fiverr singer right now, I'm pretty sure there is a Jermaine Jackson, so. I mean, I think you could be right. I wouldn't know that. Dynamite but, I mean, dropping. <laughs> those bro- broadcast lessons are really paying off for you, Monty. <laughs> Uh, there's a winky face by this, and it's from Tan, that I know he asks you a lot of questions, so it's kind of tongue-in-cheek. Is K-State still recruiting Jeremiah Crawford, D.Y.? I honestly don't know. That, I don't either. That, I mean, be, yeah. be, they certainly were before signing day, but they just d- haven't really seen generate any, generating anything towards the 2020 class for February at this point. Top Ramen asks a good question. I'll put this on D.Y. too, and then let Mason and Nelson add thoughts if you missed something. Are all 22 of next season starters already on the roster? And I'll add a caveat saying that I'm counting signed guys as on the roster. Yeah, I, I think so. I do, uh, yeah. I, there's a chance maybe they they get, you know, the perfect situation to land a grad transfer offensive tackle. I don't think that's very likely, but maybe they do. But I think the better chance is, is that it's going to have to be an in-house uh, option for offensive tackle, which means all 22 are – on the roster right now. Is there any other position you guys think that, boy, there's a guy that it, even – because you're looking at this stage, it's probably going to be, yeah, junior college transfer, lightly recruited high school guy, but maybe there's a spot other than what D.Y. talked about where a guy could come in and start next year. I think they're all here. No, I agree. there's a stud receiver out there somewhere. Yeah. Uh, Fingers crossed. Neilio 2, I don't know the answer to this either. I'm going to put D.Y. on the spot. I mean, I know what I would say. Yeah. Um, let's see what you say. Is the football recruiting staff still planning on potentially adding more recruiters? With Missouri and KU obviously down, both as teams, and then some changes with you know Kansas City area recruiters, it seems like an opportunistic time to put uh, to take advantage of that situation. I agree, but it'll probably and they, I know they want to, but it's going to be dependent on you know how much money you donate to the university. So do it now. <laughs> the hundred million dollars, you know. <laughs> there you go. So, um. Yeah, I don't know the answer to the question either. I, I know the intention is they want to do it, but I'd be I'd like you. I'm not going to lie to you and say yes, they're going to do it because I haven't heard definitively that says, "Yep, they're going to do this by this point and have this much." So I don't know. I don't Can know. I pose a question. Yeah. yeah. If you had the choice between spend more money on say Scotty Hazelton or spend the money uh, on more help in recruiting, where, where would you spend the money? Uh, and that's I mean, a really good question. I would still go recruiting because it's still behind the times by a good portion. See, I would go Hazelton, and that, but that's probably still me just having being taught, you know, over the course of my K State fandom to value coaching over recruiting. And I, and I know you love Hazelton too. Yeah. That's not the point. I'm not I sure. Mean, but yeah, but the money. I mean, maybe you know, if you're talking about. I don't want to talk about the guy's salary, but if you're talking about adding a couple hundred fifty thousand dollars or three fifty thousand dollar recruiting guys, you may get more bang for your buck on the recruiting guys, you know. And, yeah. I, and I don't know that the money will be anything that tips the scale. And I don't know when it, just, yeah, yeah, when it comes right. to Hazelton, so that's another thing I think about because I think he's probably has a desire to get back to the NFL because I think it's less about the money and more about having your springs and summers off and not recruiting. Yeah. <laughs> True. Nelson, I want to ask this to you. This is KSU Legacy Twenty Five. With the Will Howard, Jacob Rubley coming in, commitments as the presumable future at quarterback of K State. Does this mean the age of scrambling running backs at K State, running quarterbacks at K State, is over? If so, does this bother you? Considering most of K State's quarterback legends, Bishop, Roberson, Klein, etc., have had incredible running ability, I enjoy watching a quarterback that is a weapon on the ground, and don't know how I'd feel watching a pa- pocket passer for K State going forward. You're the longest-standing fan of all this really to this. If that's what that means, does that bug you? It does not bug me at all as long as they're mobile enough, which I think they are, to take advantage of the quarterback run game for to 
six, eight times a game to make defenses be honest and, and honor it. And to relieve some concern from that poster, every quarterback they had at North Dakota State could still run. Like, they were still mobile. Carson Wentz is a really good athlete. Yeah. Easton Stick is a really good athlete. The guy they got right now playing quarterback, Trey Lance, is a really good athlete. They're still getting really good athletes. They're just going to be throw first. You could still be mobile enough to do damage and still be throw first. I mean, you get to see Dak running around on Sundays a little bit. Do you need to see a guy who's mobile out there? Or are you okay with well, the transition? Well, I mean, Dak, Dak and Carson Wentz are very similar in the fact, like, they can move when they have to. Right. It's just – but they're, they don't want to do that first, which is good because I think Skyler – Part of his issues this year, we saw him get to the point where he wanted to get out of the pocket too fast, and that kind of hurt him. I got a few from KSU Burke. His first couple are kind of kind of joking and stuff. I'll ask the last two here. <laughs> I mean, realistic expectations for the rest of conference basketball season: six six and twelve in conference. Like I haven't broken it down, but I think six and twelve is hard. I mean, you're zero and two right now. It means you're going six and ten the rest of the way. And the two games they lost are the games they could, could have and should have gotten. You got, so. you got, you got. And TCU is at home. That's a Oklahoma on a road. You got to do. You got to win those. Give me's at home. That's really what you. Six at home. You need to win those. Yeah. Right. I mean, <laughs> you lost one. It, it can change in a heartbeat. I, I mean, I hate saying this. I'm saying, I'm not. When I say expectations, you shouldn't accept this or be happy with it. But I'm probably putting it four. You know, four conference wins right now this year. Is my I, 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 Maybe that's too I'll low. I'll say four or five. The ceiling's probably six if that's what yeah. he's going for. Yeah. yeah. I think five and thirteen. I'm a little bit more optimistic just because I think those bottom six teams are going to beat up on each other. And K State's. They've lost a couple that they maybe should have had. They're going to get a couple that they shouldn't have. Yeah, and four's low, but I mean, yeah, I think six and twelve, I'd be surprised. Going I mean, back to surprised going back to Bruce that. Weber's yeah. first year in the Big Twelve, everybody has at least there has been at least one team to finish four and fourteen or worse, including some zero and eighteen, some one and seventeens, all that bad stuff. Oh, th- thanks for making us feel better. <laughs> yeah. Men's basketball starters next year. So we've kind of chattered through this, but now we've been asked it specifically by Burke. So I'm going to take my honest. I like the last line that you said. Yeah, but I'm going to change it already. <laughs> I mean, because I I think all three, I think all three freshmen will start next year, meaning Antonio Monty and Dejuan. I don't see any of them not being starters. I think you can start Monty at the five, Antonio at the four, Dejuan. At the I thought three. you were talking about about the ones that were right. starting this year. I, I was think, like, whoa. I think Mike McGurl will start next year on that team. I think Nigel Pack starts. And right? so I'm probably going to start Nigel Pack. I'd probably say. Pack at the one, McGurl at the two, Dave one. So I'm taking Dave. I'm, now I'm taking something off the floor, but maybe that changes. So if I'm betting my life, Pack, McGurl, Dave Juan Gordon, Antonio Gordon, Montavious Murphy. I, I like that, and that was probably something similar. I would say I think the the debate will be who at the four, right, Miguel or Antonio Gordon. Right. I I think the debate should be at the two slash three with McGurl and Miguel. I, I think I, I think you're better. I, I finish your thought because yeah, because no offense to Mike, but I still think he's much better served as a sixth man. I that's how I am. I think they're. I think I, I like Mike. He's played better than any of the other guards this year. Yep. But I think he should just come off the bench so you can start David Sloan and Bruce. I get it. You love defense, but my word, the way you win basketball games is by putting the ball in the hole. Right. And David Sloan, he hit the biggest shot of your game the other night. Put the ball in the hole, and if you still lose, you've already been losing. Uh, no, I, I do agree at this point. I mean, I think you had about and my, and, this, and Mike McGurl, he can still play twenty nine minutes at yeah. the six man easily. And I I, I don't want to be this guy, but I do want to point out because others will like Cartier Jada is supposed to be a senior next Correct. year. Correct. Yeah. But you know that's a good question. I I just don't expect him to be on the team. I think he's somebody who's been oh, I mean relatively open. I mean in the media talking about you know potentially a professional career next year. He needs to play well enough to earn that. I understand like that. But yeah, we're not talking to be back on the team because. I, I would guess he won't be. Yeah. You know, I mean, and I, that's not set I think having that, that one, but, yeah. and then knowing that a guy like him, he has the athleticism, he's shown what he can do, you can find a place to play professional basketball. Correct. I saw the other day Ron Anderson is still playing professional basketball. Yeah. So you can play if you want to play. And it's, it would seem he already has his mind made up for the most part, and once you do, it's really hard to come back from yeah. that. Immaculate Conception. He says, congrats on giving up candy and ice cream becoming skinny. That's for me. I appreciate that very much. I, I did, too, um, a year ago. <laughs> that, no, you're still skinny. Why is it called a pair of pants, but I only put on a shirt? 
No idea. No idea. I wondered. It's kind of the same concept. And if you think about it, more holes, holes on a shirt. Arms, like, more holes on a shirt? Yeah. yeah. You got one up here, one down here, two arms. So that's four. I, just, I can't imagine like ever putting on a leg sleeve and saying I put on a pants. You know what I mean? Like, so I, I don't know. It's, it's a good question. A pantalone. <laughs> uh, top three streaming shows of all time. So streaming shows right means I can't say like Breaking Bad because that was on AMC, I guess, right? Right. So like streaming shows, hmm. Game of Thrones, and that eight, but and that HBO. HBO. Yeah, I, I'll kind of cheat this and say that one of them's Arrested Development because it spent its last two seasons on Netflix. Right. Came back. Yep. I, I've only just recently started watching streaming shows, so I'll go with Jack Ryan. That's that's the one I've watched so far. I know that I love uh, Ozark is fantastic. That's a streaming only show. If you haven't seen that, you on Netflix. Yeah, you, and uh, Nats is watching that. I haven't seen that. I've heard of that. Have I, I watched, watched that? you with Bu- with it's Bailey, good. and it, it's um, pretty it's pretty solid. It's very interesting. I'm in the middle of season two. I would right throw now. in Mind Hunters, which is a serial killer like BTK like so- focus show. Um, we've given you four or five, I think, yeah. here, you know, that you can look at. But, yeah. Lance Zim says this is a big picture question. This is long. I'm just going to read it, guys. K-State fans still lament about missed opportunities for national football relevance in 1998 and 2012. Is it reasonable to say that K-State may never get a chance to get as close to national championship as we did then? Even as I type that question, I appreciate that it sounds a bit too negative, but hear me out. It is more based on logic than emotion. Seeing LSU displace Oklahoma before the first quarter was even at the halfway mark was a rude awakening for me as a K-State fan. Alabama, Ohio State, LSU, Clemson, and Georgia are in a league entirely of their own on a national level. Oklahoma is in a league entirely of its own on the Big 12. It seems like an expansion of the college football playoff to eight teams is a given over the next few years, which on the surface shall but guarantee a Big 12 team in the seat, a seat at the CFP every year. But I think this has become a be careful what you ask for moment for K-State and its peer institutions. Adding one more round of the playoffs as another obstacle for K-State to the breakthrough to the for K-State to break through the disparity that exists in the in football and reach the national title game. The mountain of program that K-State has to climb to get the national title game has always been steep. The two times we were quote one game away did not go well. The introduction of the CFP, along with the conference realignment trends, has made it an even steeper climb. In theory, that national championship game would be two more games away from the level it was each time K-State missed its opportunity in 98-12 if it expands to eight teams. Selfishly, shouldn't we be against adding another round to the playoff system on its face value for the sake of K-State? After a few more drinks, you can entertain this question. If all the power brokers within college football agreed that they needed to take steps to increase parity among power five football programs, what rules would you institute that could have the greatest positive effect on achieving that goal? That's the second question. So back to the first one. I'll, I'll summarize it real shortly. I get what he's getting at. It makes a lot of sense. On one hand, I, I would too. say, yes, it is harder because now you can't just, quote, unquote, kind of get lucky, have a nice season, then beat one really good team in the championship. So I would say, yes. On the flip side, though, everyone's playing against the same, the same rules. Now Ohio State has to beat three good teams or four good teams in that scenario. Mathematically, it's probably exactly the same. But I understand the premise because, yes, a team that typically isn't as talented as those has to beat them more times than they used to. Nelson. I, underst- I understand the logic. It's probably two-faced. One, some of those teams are look like they're in a league of their own. Two, you, you play more games. More games means it's difficult. However, adding that eight team in means you automatically have a spot at the table if you win your league where that isn't the case now. And I think that's the kicker. I think you have a more realistic chance with an A-team because you have an automatic chance to get there now, whereas you didn't before. Now, if you're talking about the League of Their Own stuff too, I get that. It seems that way. But Oklahoma almost beat Georgia in the playoffs. What was it, last year? Two years ago. Yeah. Almost beat Georgia in the play. They were up on them by two touchdowns, I think, at one point and, in the game. And Kansas State had Oklahoma down by 30 at one point this year. So, yes, the, the gap is wide, but it's not insurmountable. You've seen it come down multiple and, times. And with the playoff now, to me, it feels a lot like the Final Four where just getting to it is a part of the excitement and fun. True. Because once you get yeah. to the Final Four, who cares if you're the runner-up? You better win the thing because – Texas Tech, to me, you're a Final Four team. You're not the national runner-up. Final Four team. So it's just getting there that, that makes it good, fun. Uh, and I think, point. you know, to the point of that, it makes a lot of sense. And I think it's going to be tough for K-State to get to a playoff until there are automatic tie-ins just because OU really hurt the Big 12's reputation this year with the butt kicking. Because I think whoever won the Big 12 this year was going to get into the playoff. But next year, a one-loss Big 12 team isn't going to have benefit of the doubt. 
and I think it's one of those things where we we tried fixing things too much by making it a panel that comes up with the four teams. They should have just done a BCS playoff. Yep. Keep the BCS, take the top four teams from there. That would have helped K State and Big Twelve teams a lot better. Yeah, I just said yeah. It depends on how you define getting as close as as twelve and ninety eight. If you have to make the national championship game to do that, then I'm I would sure say it wouldn't no. be as close, right? If making the playoff get you there in your mind, then I'd say yeah, we we got a shot at some point maybe. The next question I think is interesting. The whole you know how to make parity. The only answer I can come up with is eliminate recruiting and pay players a salary cap. I mean, that's, if you wanted parity in college football, you take away scholarships, you give every program you know who agrees that they can afford it this X amount of dollars to pay players um, like a free agent system. I mean, if, that's the only way I could understand. If you, wanted, if you want true parity in a sport, you need a salary cap. I'm not advocating for this, but I think the way to do it is by reducing scholarships. I was going to say, you can yeah, reduce scholarships. You can only reduce or hand out 50 scholarships versus 82. Yeah, reducing scholarships would do it. I just don't want to take those opportunities away. Do right, I don't yeah. want to do that. Yeah. So it hasn't been recording for the last hour. <laughs> well, if it wasn't, you'd go home and do it by yourself. <laughs> I mean, so. So that would be out. What are we looking at here? There it is. Sorry, yeah, we'll talk about it off off mic here in a second because we're about we're about we're about done. Um, man, I mean, this, the last question I'm seeing is who's the front runner for intramural softball this year? Um, a lot of repeats, really, of the questions. I mean, yeah. So this is stuff we've all really, really talked about at this point um, throughout the KSO show, presented by People State Bank Legacy Insurance. I don't know how long we've been on, Flanders. How long has the show been going? Hour 15, man. That's not bad. I said oh, an hour. You know, we've been going good. an hour. So uh, we're gonna wrap this puppy up. I'm gonna go around the table again. I would think I would take Jimmy for coming, Mason, you know, Nat for running this thing, Kurtz, Dy, Flanders, parents, Nelson. That's it. Our waitress did a really nice job. We're heading to Austin in the morning. Um, we'll be there, you know, Friday and Saturday. Go back Sunday. It's rainy Street. Enjoy it. I think we're staying on Rainy Street. Actually, Shoot, then we might have is. to. Yeah, Game's no. not till Saturday or Saturday night. Yeah, maybe tomorrow night we get after. It. What do you, I mean, we'll yeah. see. We'll yeah. see what happens. Yeah, I mean, we didn't go down there on Friday to just to sleep in the hotel room. Exactly. You're right. <laughs> Are you going to go out, D.Y.? No. D.Y.'s not He's going He's coming out. out. He's not going I'm out. I'm bringing him. <laughs> so we're going to wrap it up. Appreciate your time. Appreciate you listening. Appreciate the questions. We'll be back here on the KSO Show early next week. We'll have, of course, tons of coverage on the side of this Texas game. And keep an eye out for Derek Young's, you know, almost daily football or Pretty previews much. for class of 2021. Well, I thought you were going to say notebooks. This is almost daily notebooks, Flanders. too. Will you be quiet <laughs> so I can do the show? Um, Flanders has some stuff sitting in the admin that we're just waiting to hit publish on. So we'll look for that as well as soon as we get a chance. In the show, Force Flanders. Tell your friends, please. <laughs>